You are listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. Have you ever swam in deep water? Not 10 to 15 feet deep, but deep water, where you look down and you see the light trying to punch its way through, refracting, stretching, and reaching until darkness and the deep take over, and you get this quiet, unsettled fear of what is beyond where the light can reach. The water to the people of the ancient world was always a symbol of chaos, the unknown and uncontrollable power, and it was feared. They lived with this balance between needing water to sustain life, and water being the place where the great deep waits in the darkness, a place where the great creatures of the deep roam. And yet in the deep, God has redeemed. Over the chaotic waters, God's spirit has hovered, and within the waters, God has worked. There's a theme in scripture that I want to go into with you. A place where there is life, chaos, cleansing, depth, fear, and sustenance, which all matter to God. Because what God loves, he puts into the water. Well, good morning again, friends. Um, As we get going today, I get to take a moment and uh, welcome you, Foundry West, into the Foundry family. As you get started, we're excited to have you be a part of us. It's exciting to know you guys are gathering out there on the north side of Holland, and we pray God's best as we do this uh, for the glory of Jesus. Um, Would you join me in a brief moment of prayer as we get ready to dive into the scriptures? Lord Jesus, we are your people and this is your word and we claim uh, the transformation that is ours in Christ, that the spirit of God would come and fill us, that you would work in such a way, God, that those uh, those of us who know you would know you more deeply by the end of this and maybe for those who've come here today just to see what church is about, they would experience you in a way that would make them want you more. Lord, our heart is to see you in the scriptures and then to live a life like you, not by our power, but by the power of the Spirit. Help us to be humbled and to follow as disciples do. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today we're going to talk about into the water. And uh, the humbling experience of going into the water. We've, we've said it before, we'll say it again. What God loves, he puts into the waters. And today we're going to look at this and kind of wrestle with this concept and idea. Here's, here's one thing. Um, I don't know about you, but I, I love AFV, right? Anybody? Like, they're like 35 falls in 50 seconds. I'm like, children, like everyone be quiet. This is why we live. And I love just watching people just eat it. It's great. But um, we had an experience where um, we were all as a family, we went to Vermont. I don't know why. It was awesome. And there was a lot of Ben and Jerry's. And, um, and we were at this, this hotel and we were swimming and you could hike up the ski slopes to a reservoir where they uh, stored up water to make snow in the winter. And you could swim in it. It was this beautiful, clear lake way up in the mountains of Vermont. It was great. And um, they had this little pillow that you go out on and then someone jumps on and boop, you know, kind of bops them off. It wasn't real high. It it wasn't like you were flying people 30 feet in the air, but you'd like lay on it, you know, and like a kid would go four or five feet in the air. And it was Erica's turn to to go out on the pillow. So she goes out there and and normally athletic and, 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 you know, I mean, I'm never going to ask her to do gymnastics, not your thing, but but she goes out on, uh, my wife goes out on this pillow And she gets out there, and normally one lays upon their posterior and back. And she gets out there, and she gave me permission to tell this. She goes out tentatively, you know, like like a little, you know, kind of sheepish. And she's like, boom, and just eats it, like her face into the thing. I'm like, oh. And then she just rolled off into the water, and we're all like, who's that lady? (laughs) You know, and she's like, oh, my nose hurts. And the rest of the trip, she's like, my nose hurts. And we're like... You shamed us. That's not how you get in the water. And normally you're a fish. I mean, she can swim around. She's great. But that was one of the most ungraceful moments I've ever seen. It was very humbling for her because she can. She'll dive and jump and swim and anything. But it just didn't work out that time. You know, it was just this horrible like face plant rolling. What's happened? And then into the water. And I think sometimes when we look at scripture, 
when we look at our lives and we look at the fact that God wants us to follow him as he has displayed himself in Christ, we don't like to go into the waters on his terms because it might look more like the little face plant in Vermont, right? It doesn't look as, as we want it. We don't often like to go into a humbling experience. But God has given us an example, and he has showed us time and again of what it means to be humble in the way we serve, minister, and care for this world. It doesn't deny who we are in Christ, that we are more than conquerors, but it does call us to a new kind of life. We get our example and take um, this moment today from Matthew chapter 3, verse 1 to 13. It's a story of John the Baptist and Jesus' baptism. Follow along as I read. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, which would have been the countryside around Jerusalem, so like Vriesland or Drent to Zealand. Repent, for the kingdom of, of heaven has come near. This is um, he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight a path for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey, which I think like, you know, all the millennials and kind of earthy people like, yeah, I just eat locusts and wild honey. And it sounds so cool. You know, we sanitize scripture. Bees. He had to go get the honey. He, he had to go get the honey. The bees would have stung him. I just want you to think. He ate bugs and got stung getting his sugar. Like that had to, think of the life he lived. It, don't let scripture be scrubbed. This was, well, it was a rough life but he was called. People went out to John from Jerusalem and all of Judea and the whole region of the Jordan confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming where he was baptizing, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children of Abraham. The ax is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. John said, I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me comes the one who is more powerful than I am, whose sandals I'm not even worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand. He will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then, get this, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him or say no. And he said, no, I need to be baptized by you. And yet you come to me? And Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And then John consented. I think it's amazing how this goes. When we look at this, And we understand that John consented to baptize the Son of God. It says, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water. And at that moment, the heaven was open. He saw the Spirit of God descending in bodily form like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, this is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. If you ever wonder about the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and perfect union, you see it right there the Spirit, the Father, and the Son, all working together in perfect unity. Today, we are gonna talk about the fact that what God loves, he puts into the water. But sometimes the waters of this life are humbling, and God calls us to a humility that maybe is beyond our nature. Well, it's always beyond our nature. It is hard to be humbled, But I want to pause for a moment and look at the example that was set before us. First of all, we have John the Baptist. He is the son of the high priest, Zechariah. 
and he would have lived a life of great influence and wealth in Judea. He could have been well known. He could have been loved, and he could have had a very comfortable life. But he gave it all up. He ate bugs and honey. He had horrible clothes, and he lived a life isolated. He lived a life apart from the community he could have been a, deeply ingrained in. He was set apart in some way. And we know this because he lived out in the wilderness. And what he was doing was preparing a way for the one to come. He was preparing a way for Jesus Christ to come. And I want you to look at the humility of John the Baptist and understand that John the Baptist was preparing the way for Christ. And in preparing the way, people began to confess their sins. He began to baptize them and put them into the waters. But then, well, we recognize that that repentance is crying out that something's broken. One of the great broken narratives of our world is we say this to our kids quite often, oh, nothing's wrong with you. You're great just the way you are. And we believe that because we love them, but it's just not true. Because they, like us, are deeply broken and deeply flawed. And the flaw starts back before they took their first breath. It goes back to Adam and Eve, the very first sin in Genesis chapter 3, where Adam and Eve broke humanity's relationship with God because they wanted to be like God. Their pride wanted them to be, well, on the same level as God. Have you ever seen one of those precocious little kids who's like six years old and talks like, you know, like kind of a politician and they talk to you and they, and they talk to you very on equal terms and you're like, although charming, this is kind of weird. Anybody else ever have that? You're like, I mean, precocious is all get out, but that's just odd because they talk like a little adult and they carry themselves in a way that doesn't quite fit the state they are in life. Adam and Eve had that same disease. They decided that they would exalt themselves over and against God to be like him. But then we check out the identity of Christ who would heal humanity. And he would bridge the divide between people and God. And he would do so by laying down his place in heaven as God and identify with sinful people. I don't know if you've had this experience, but maybe as a parent, you knew your parents to be one thing, very strict and orderly in these things, and then they have grandbabies, and everything changes, and you're like, where's my mom and dad? What did you do with them? And put the candy away, right? Because they just become these, well, maybe different people. They become something so much more gentle, they descend to the kid's level and play with them. And you look at your mom and you realize that she not only knew how to play sorry, she let you win the one or two times you play, but she'll play it daily with them. You see your, your mom, the kid's grandmother, playing hide and seek. And you're like, that never happened. We never hide and sought mom. But maybe she just hid from us. But we never played those games. And you see a grandparent go from being like this, your parent very kind of structured and just trying to get through life to this person who is playful and whimsical and just goes right down to the level of the kids and plays with their grandkids, identifies with them. That's in, a, in the most basic way what we see Jesus doing. He gives up heaven and all of its glory and all of its riches he gives it up to be the son of a single mother born to a carpenter, hunted by Herod. We look at the life of Christ and we realize that John indeed was the forerunner. His life was humbled from what it could be in order to just give us a hint of how humbled the life of Christ was when he came down, when the son of God became man. We, we have this uh, section in Scripture um, out of Philippians, the book of Philippians, uh, chapter 2, verse 5 to 11, and it is called the Christological hymn, the hymn that describes Christ in these beautiful terms. Paul uses his most elegant Greek to say something. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not see equality with God as something to be grasped. Rather, he made himself 
in the very nature of a servant. Like, I love that. I love that he made himself into the nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, found in the appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place. He gave Jesus the name that is above every name, that at Jesus' name, every knee would bow and every tongue confess under, in heaven above and on earth below that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and Lord to the glory of God the Father. What do we learn about this? What is Paul telling us That in some way, you and I have the nature of Adam and Eve that exalts itself against God. But we are called to be transformed into the image of one who said this, who was this, the very nature of God. But rather than clinging to it and considering equality with God, something to fight for and hold on to, Jesus surrendered it. He opened his hands and he became in the very form of a servant, just a servant, a human being in the form of what he had created. And he served people. And he was faithful to God. And what I look at in this is that there's waters of humility that must be tough to grasp for Jesus. Can you imagine the Son of God going out and submitting to the baptism of John the Baptist in a river he created? Ever think of that? of the power of God in his humility in Christ Jesus, anything you wonder, what would Christ do to bring me near to the heart of God? This tells us he'd do anything. He would be baptized into a baptism that everyone at that time would recognize as a baptism of repentance. But Jesus had not sinned. He was being humbled. Let people think what they want. Jesus lived in submission to his father. And it humbled him. And what I believe about the waters of humility is that they're painful. They're cold. I don't know about you, but have you ever jumped into a body of water a little too early in May? And you come out and you're, good. And you're like really cold. Anybody? Yeah, it's horrible. I jumped into rivers in Colorado when I was young. And you forget in May when it's warmed up in the valley that that's all runoff from the high country. All the snow's melting and you jump in and you literally just like one of those lizards on a lake, you run out of it, you're like, it's super duper 39 degrees. It's shocking. I think the waters of humility are shocking to us. Why would God call us to it? Well, Hebrews 12, 6 reminds us that the Lord disciplines those he loves. He disciplines those he loves. And I want you to know and I want me to know that God opposes our pride with lethal accuracy and relentless determination because our pride will exalt us over and against God. And God asks only one thing, will you be made into my image? Not be exalted against me, will you be made in my image? If God disciplines those whom he loves, as the author of Hebrews says, then we can take comfort in knowing that when we went to the proverbial spiritual woodshed, it wasn't because God was abusive. It It was because there was a nature in us that must bend the knee to our Lord and Savior. And our American ideal of independence, bootstrap pulling up people, doesn't hold water in the Christian faith. We cannot be self-made men and women in the Christian faith. We are remade men and women in the image of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. We can't stand on our own. We kneel before the one who gave us life. Everyone God loves, he puts into the waters. So we know that the waters of humility will come into our lives. The question is, how do we enter them? How will you go into the waters? How will you allow them to come? Will we see ourselves as better than others and not needing humility in our life? Will we be humble in our daily lives and then eventually, you know, step into those under God's authority or will we fight him and eventually unwillingly be placed into the waters of humility by God's love in a painful way? We have to understand the power 
of the waters of humility. See, understanding is key in this life. Just understanding like um, the context of what's going on. You may not know this, but I worked at SeaWorld in San Diego. It was awesome. And I had a lot of fun doing it and we enjoyed it and it was great. But there were some people that I didn't like at SeaWorld because they would go and they want the best seats in Shamu Stadium. The best seats. Now, I worked in entertainment, maintenance, and construction, so we'd work on the acrylic of the tanks and different things. But I do remember seeing people as we'd be, you know, you get a spring, a little leak or something, so you'd be patching it, and you could hear people coming into the stadium around you, and they're talking about seeing Shamu. Shamu! You know, and it was so great, and everybody was excited to see the whale do this. And there's these front six rows that are painted blue. It's called the, yeah, the splash zone. You know, they see the sign, splash zones. If you sit here, Shamu is going to get you wet. But they want the good seats, and they sit down with their Nikon $9,000 camera. And like, ooh, I'm going to get a picture of Shamu. And then Shamu, weighing multiple tons and looking like me off a diving board, cannonballs. And they're like, boosh. First of all, that water is always cold. It's like 44 degrees because they're orcas from the northwest in San Diego. But um, very cold water, so it's shocking. And you're like, oh, takes your breath away. And then you realize your Nikon is hissing because it's dying a saltwater death. And, and people are like, oh, what? How did that happen? And then Shamu lays on its back, kicks up its tail and goes, whoosh, and like splashes you. And like, oh, oh how dare you? I came to a theme park, not an abuse park. And they walk off. And you're like, you were in the splash zone, Max. You shouldn't be mad at us. You sat on the blue seat and you wanted pictures, but you didn't pay attention to the signage around you. Christians should never be upset that the waters of humility touch our lives because we live in the splash zone. We live in the waters of of humility. See, some people act like they're fine. They act like they're fine. I'm humble. You got to read my blog on it. It's powerful and interpretively, you know, strong, but graciously written because I'm humble. I understand it at a granular level more than you. Very good. Me, humble, right? We understand humility at a head context. But the slightest splash of the waters of humility in our lives, and we are like that person with a Nikon. How dare that happen to me? Why, God, would you reject me so publicly? How could you let that happen? Why would you let that into my life? But then we have to do the hard work of looking into our lives and see if we pass the splash zone test. Do we pass the test that says we expect God to be cutting out of our lives things that exalt themselves against him? Or do we expect God just to tolerate our pride? Do we expect God to tolerate that which opposes him or reform it into the character of Christ? And I think it's important that we take a splash zone test. So if you find yourself thinking or saying some of these things, Maybe you want to pause. If you find yourself seeing, being with someone and think, I can't be seen with them. I can't be seen with them. Maybe they're lesser than you. Maybe there's someone you're not proud of. If you find yourself saying that, you might be in for a moment of being humbled. If you ever find yourself saying, I can't do that job. That's below me. I won't ask you to raise your hand. I'll just raise mine and say, that one stings an awful lot. There are times where I'm like, I don't want to do that thing. I don't want to do that thing. I, I, I'm in charge. No, you, <laughs> no, the son of God was a servant. Is there something I can't do because it's beneath me? If you find yourself saying, how could they ask me to do that? Don't they know how talented, smart, Gifted, loving, perfectly equipped for much better tasks, I am. Have you ever thought that? 
How could you think that I would do that job? I am so much more than that. How could you think that I would be put down to such a level as to serve in such a basic way? How about, why wasn't I recognized, rewarded, or acknowledged? I do more than everyone in this place. To which somebody just wanted to say, amen, preach all day, I'm ready for the waters. Why? Because that's us, isn't it? Isn't this you? Or is this just a horrible caricature of my big head? See, I think the reality is we are these things. How about this? They wouldn't survive a day without me. Help me out. Anybody ever say that? (laughs) And then they do, and you're kind of hurt. You're like, wow, you seem to move on well. (laughs) You know, because the truth is we're not all, we're not the legend we are in our own minds. But what if we have to deal with these thoughts on a real honest level that if these things are coming in and out of our mind and when we get humbled and asked to do something below what we thought we were gifted for, that maybe the waters of humility are far more gracious than the turbulent seas of humiliating ourselves. Humiliating ourselves because we think we're worth something. And we're going to demand our rights and our pride is going to hold us up when the Son of God, well, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But instead he made himself into nothing by taking the form of a servant. Being made in human likeness and found in the appearance as a man, Christ humbled himself to be obedient unto death, even the shameful death of a criminal's cross. Discipleship is the art of following. And we are called to follow Christ in mission. Did we ever think that he wouldn't lead us into the waters that most make us bristle and most make us want to fight back and say, no, I'm better than that? If scripture tells us anything in this story, it tells us that we are not better than that. We are honored and blessed to share the waters of humility with the Lord and Savior of our lives, the author and perfecter of all our faith, the creator and sustainer of this universe has invited us into the waters he went to first. When we as a church live into the identity of knowing that what God loves, he puts into the waters. We will not hold so tightly to our human titles and our, and our self-exalted roles, but we will serve in the same manner as Christ, who being in the very nature God, did not grasp equality with him, but became a servant. May that be said at the end of our days. Amen? Lord Jesus Christ, we, your church, gather in this moment, and we just give you thanks for who you are. Thank you, God, for the waters of humility that we resist so much that we don't want to go into because we're scared that our reputation will be sullied. But God, you remake us in your image in those waters. So we ask, come Lord Jesus and splash us a little. And if it hurts, may you remind us by bringing our community, our church around us that we are not alone in being splashed. We are part of the great line of disciples who followed Christ, not just in mission, but we followed him into the waters, recognizing that we can't do it on our own. So into the death of Christ, we received our baptism so that in the life of Christ, we may be raised up with him. May it be so of us today. God, we bless you and we thank you for the opportunity we have to be people remade, no longer our pride defining us, but the identification of being made into the image of Christ. Come, Lord Jesus, do the work in the lives of us, saints, sinners, those redeemed by your blood. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Friends, please join me, stand, sing. I'll be honest, I, um, I, I kind of despised this message and the preparation of it because it just shined a light on how um, despicably proud I am. Um, And I ended up praying a prayer this week just so we all feel on equal ground here.
Um, I was like, God, please don't humble me, whatever you're about to do. Because all I could see was my pride contesting him. My desire to be something or be recognized as something. And um, sometimes how I would push for that. But, um, you know, am I that passionate about Jesus being known? If I'm honest, like, oh God, I'm in trouble. Like, I want you to know it's real. We fight this all the time. Pride is the one thing within us that exalts itself time and again against God. And God will not have it in our lives. So we get the high calling to follow Christ into the waters. And I hope you will join me in them. It's not easy. I don't know what he's gonna do in my life. I just know the work continues. The work continues. And God will humble us that we more fully reflect his son, our savior and Lord. It's not an easy work, but it is the Christian's work to go about this life not reflecting your best self, but reflecting the one who saved you from your worst. As you do this, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. My friends, it is time for the church to leave the building. You're dismissed. Thanks for listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net.